Hello. In uh, exactly eight minutes, we're going to start. I would just ask the Twitter specialists and the speakers to come here so we can just do an informal briefing before the event. Thank you.
Mettiti qua, così ti tengo sott'occhio. Tutto a posto qua? We're about to start in uh, hopefully two minutes. So if you can start taking a seat. Whatever you like. Front rows, ten dollars. a girare in sala per sapere chi c'è. Ok, mettiamone uno per tavolo già adesso, così partiamo. Partiamo da qua. Sì, 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 sì. Se qualcuno sta qua a gestire le slide, se no faccio fatica. It's not bad. I think it's supposed to be good. So, I think it's time to start. So we have 50 minutes late due to the delay in the plenary session. So I think we'll recoup the 50 minutes at the end. So don't worry. What you have paid, you will get it. So for, first of all, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. And uh, this is workshop number three, in case someone, uh, some of you pick up the wrong room. Workshop number three is namely the best workshop for, of the day, so you are in the right place. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So, uh, first, first question for some of you. Why are we today in Venice? The weather is pretty good. Not yet rain, so it's good news. Uh, we are in Venice be oops, because... Uh, Today we can really do something that is meaningful. Meaning that the, at the end of today, we'll be prepared what is called the Venice Declaration. And the Venice Declaration is supposed to identify what are the main guidelines, actions, that are supposed to inform the European policy. So today we can really try to help uh, the European institution and the countries, the governments, to put a step in the right direction. And so I just uh, wrap it up for you what are the main uh, 10 topics that have been identified as part of what will be the Venice Declaration. I don't know if you can read it, uh, but just let me point it out some uh, of the key words particularly our 10 points, what are identified as digital actions on game changers. And uh, the first one is digital has to be at the center of a renewed industrial policy. Agreed. And the first time the word startup is pretty mentioned, officially mentioned in a document of the European Council. Then supporting digital European cross-sectors, cross countries, world-class clusters. So clusters, cross-sectors, cross-countries. Europe has to achieve a true digital single market. All European citizens should be able to connect to the internet at high speed by 2020. Online trust and security, key condition for the development of European digital economy. Europe must exploit, recognize, and drive the data and cloud revolution. 
cities are to become laboratories for dynamic digital Europe, upgrading people's skills and prepare young people for today's and tomorrow job is key. And point number one, that is really what we are all about, Europe has to become the best place to start and scale up a digital economy. This is what we have to discuss today. And there are some other points that mean uh, set up the right policy, obviously not starting from scratch, but starting what has already been identified in the Startup Manifesto. Hopefully all of you have signed it. Uh, we need to pool our resources in areas like access to finance, meaning venture capital, business angels, crowdfunding, work together to improve access to talent, revisit our taxation policy to foster investments in high-risk company, meaning innovation, show our leadership, and create a fully integrated European ecosystem putting together startups, investors, accelerators, corporates, and university to drive our economies forward. And there is an additional point, this is point number 10, we need to modernize our public sector. So this is the main context of what is uh, supposed to be included in the Venice Declaration. What we are here today as workshop number three is to focus mostly on Point nine, Europe should become the best place to start and scale up a digital company and to identify some pragmatic things to be implemented. Easy. So we are not going to, to just to talk bullshit for three hours. We are supposed to talk about what is really important. So we're supposed to do that. So the main topics are all around, obviously, the concept of startups. I think the main ingredients are investors, research, corporates, and some uh, things that we could call ancillary things, but they are not. And there are services, meaning accelerators, anything that is related legal is related to, to the startups ecosystem, media, because we need to communicate properly this stuff, and policy. So we need, this is the ingredients that we need to cook today. We need to pick up some of them, we can pick up all of them, we just find some good recipes to move forward, pragmatical. How it works today, short intro, 15 minutes, five minutes are gone. Then we are going to have hot eight speeches, talks, by eight people that are representing the different areas. And uh, then the, start, the game starts, meaning that you are supposed to, to interact with the speakers, not raising your hands, but tweeting your thoughts. We, are, we have five Twitter specialists that are going to rebound anything you say, because we're not just going to discuss things internally between the 50, 60 that are sitting in here, but also with the entire world, possibly, hopefully. So we are going to discuss, interact between ourselves, between other people during the speeches. Based on the Twitter interaction, at the end of the speaking section, this is supposed to end around 4.30, because at each speaker we have uh, approximately eight minimum each. We are going to see what are the main topics based on the Twitter interaction. And based on that, we will pick up four main topics to be discussed, splitting in four groups around the four tables that we have organized, okay? The discussion of each table will be moderated by one of two speakers, so we can. Uh, and uh, during the discussion in each group, we will still going on discussing by Twitter because again, the discussion is not going to happen between us but hopefully with the entire ecosystem. Actually, we are in web streaming since minutes number one, so anything that we are doing will be recorded, so pay attention to what you say. And um, so, at the end of the work gr group work discussion around 5.30, we will reconvene, we will report back, the, each 
table we report back the main findings, also based on the Twitter interaction that will be monitored. And then we update the draft Venice Declaration that have been prepared. And then our two rapporteurs that are Salvo Mizzi, Telecom Italia, and Stefano Firpo, Ministero Sviluppo Economico, will report back to the plenary section what our bright minds have found out. Okay? So, just me, just me introduce your speakers so you know who they are. And you know their Twitter account. Well, starting from the right end of the table, we have Mike Butcher. Hi, Mike. Hello. Then we have... We have Easy Vidra, Google, Ben. We have uh, Praveen Paragnotti, if I said it right. European Investment Fund, probably the most important thing in Europe today, beyond the European Commission, or probably first then. Then we have um, Jessica Stacy from Nasta UK, I says, and myself. And then we have Isidro Lazo Balestrero, European Commission, Startup Europe, the real man behind the scene. Then we have Stefano Firk and Salvo Mizzi already introduced them to you. Candace Johnson, the new president of Eben Europe. Congratulations. And uh, last but not least, yes. And last but not least, uh, Elena Favilli, over there, from Team Book Two. An Italian entrepreneur moving to Silicon Valley, got admitted by 500 startups, currently incubated at Zynga bright person. So that's it. So before starting, since I spurred six minutes, I'd like to pass my mic to each of you and ask you to introduce yourselves in one minute, meaning name, surname, company, and what you do, okay? We have 50, 60 people, so we cannot spend more than 20 seconds each, okay? Am I starting? Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Taro. I'm working for France Digital. It's a French uh, alliance of startup companies and, um, and uh, VCs. We have approximately 400 members now. We've been working for a year with the European Commission, gathering a network of VCs in Europe, and uh, we're pretty proud of what happened this year. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss it later with you. Hello, I'm Jan, coming from Berlin. I'm an early stage uh, VC. Bertelsmann Venture, just I see you. Hello, uh, Jose Franca from uh, Portugal Ventures, about uh, half a billion euros of uh, assets under management, government backed company with some uh, about 20% uh, private uh, <coughs> financing as well. We are trying to develop the startup ecosystem in Portugal. Uh, we have two important networks that we are uh, driving. On the deal flow side, we have 43 partners covering universities, incubators, accelerators, uh, basically national coverage. Hey, Cousin, I say 20 seconds. And uh, on the capital side, uh, already 20 co-investors at the business angel uh, level. Thank you. I'm uh, Luigi Lenguito. I'm here on behalf of Dell, uh, worldwide larger startup after Michael bought it back in November, but also to represent the Center for Entrepreneur that is our uh, accelerator in France and across Europe. Hello, I'm Paolo Romiti. I'm the owner and uh, CEO of uh, Amiro Group. It's an holding that invests uh, in a uh, digital marketing and communication company. Antonio Dimitri from Italy, strategic partnerships at Mind the Bridge. Hello, Alessandra Giraldo, staff and live Twitter. Hello, David Montero. Uh, I manage an uh, incubator in the Basque country, north of Spain. Hello, my name is Aris Ippolito. I come from Pavia, uh, close to Milan. I have a company, a digital company. I manage translation and web marketing. Hello, my name is Klaus Matzka. Uh, I'm an internet entrepreneur turned to VC, uh, early stage venture capital. I'm based in Vienna. I'm with Pioneers, uh, you probably know Pioneers Festival and Pioneers Unplugged events in Europe. 
Hello, Luca Peirano. I'm working with the London Stock Exchange Group. Uh, at the LAC manage uh, AIM, which is probably the largest and most successful market for iGrow companies, uh, and more than happy to continue the discussion later. Hello, Gianluca Dettori, The Pixel, Early Stage and Seed Stage Venture Capital. Hey, ciao. Simon Hampton, I'm here on behalf of Allied for Startups, which, uh, as my colleague mentioned, is the uh, absolutely brand new association representing startups uh, in Europe. Um, here to work with the uh, with the Commission and the uh, the new the new Commission to make sure that all the fantastic momentum built up under Commissioner Cruz uh, continues into the new uh, into the new term. Good afternoon. I'm Kumar Dev Chatterjee. I'm the European Commission's 2014 Innovation Luminary of the Young Innovation Champion, and I'm also the founder and president of the European Young Innovators Forum, which is the largest bottom-up network of innovators and entrepreneurs in Europe. We work very closely with the Commission, the Parliament, and of course all our friends here uh, to build the ecosystem in Europe. Hi, Serena Rizzi from Italy, PR and Communication Manager for MindBridge and the Startup Europe Partnership. Hi, my name's Dominic Moxon Trich. I'm head of public policy for Europe, Middle East, and Africa for Uber, and have been working with the European Commission and various European institutions, particularly on sharing economy issues. Hi, I'm Benedetta Rese. I'm the general manager for Uber in Italy. Uh, hello, everyone. Alessandro Tommasi from Catano Zanetto, a lobbying firm uh, in Italy, Rome. Hey, I'm Stu McTavish. I'm the director of Idea Space at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm Sergio Cagol. I'm a member of the Laboratory for uh, Digital Tourism um, held by the uh, Minister of uh, Cultural Heritage and Tourism in Italy. Hello, Mariana Marcucci. I'm here as a co-founder of a project called Invasioni Digitali, Digital Invasions. There are mobs of people who support Italian cultural heritage, literally invading them and documenting the experience through social media and the web. Hello, my name is Michael Gould. I represent Esri, which is a multinational mapping company. We have 84 offices around the world. And what we do is to help uh, startups become scale-ups by providing them with map analysis, not just dots on the map, but analyzing your information on the map, what we call um, location analytics. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Fabio Troiani. I'm the CEO of uh, Business Integration Partners. It's a leading consulting company in innovation and transformation. Hello, I'm Laura Mirabella. I work for Deezer, the online streaming service for music and I'm the country manager for Italy. Uh, we were formerly a startup in Europe and now we are, we are in Italy, actually. Hello, Simona Macellari, the Innovation Knowledge Foundation are responsible for all the projects related to startup. Good afternoon, Francesco Pozzoborn, coming from Italia Camp, leading a social innovation platform in Italy. Good afternoon, I'm Paola Ravenna. I work yeah, from Venice originally and I work for the city, the municipality. I'm in charge for getting European funds for finance projects in, uh, in the city uh, in different fields like uh, social innovation, but economic development, uh, ICT and so on. Hello, Alessandro Martinini. I'm from Italy. I'm uh, director of uh, economic activities, uh, city of Venice. Renzo Vesani, <coughs> uh, I am Head of Research and Development at uh, Unipol Assicurazioni in Bologna. Stefano Nanni, Unipol again, uh, taking care of the Unipol Ideas Incubator and of R&D operations. Thank you. Hello, Elia Ferrer, working on Uber Public Policy. Uh, hello. Nico Stathopoulos, working at FIPA International in Brussels, a public affairs consultancy with a focus on technology. Hello. I'm Stefania Milo, president of Young Craft Entrepreneurs of CNA, CNA uh, under 40 here, entrepreneurs. Good afternoon, everybody. Mattia Corbetta, Italian Ministry of Economic Development, Minister's Technical Secretariat. For any 
information concerning Italy's startup law, please don't hesitate to contact me. Well, hello, I'm Stefano Fiepo. I'm the head of the technical secretariat at the Ministry of Economic Development, and I'm basically the one who designed the Startup Act in Italy, which was drafted into a law uh, one year and a half ago. Hi, Paolo Lombardi. I am a director of TechPix, which is a public accelerator international in Italy. So it's the first uh, kind of startup Chile that we know of in Europe. Hi, my name is Fabrizio Porrino. Since January, I represent Globally Facility Life. I'm founder of Digitalians. Before, I was advisor, as many of you know, of the ITRA committee and the president and IMCO committee at the European Parliament. And before, I was Isidro, good colleague. Hi, my name is Mario Terroni, and I am a founder of a Facility Life. Roberto Bonzi, I'm a curious journalist, uh, a former Reuters uh, reporter, converted the, in a uh, happy storyteller with the Do It Yourself project called Italiani di Frontiera, Frontiers Italian, investigating talent and innovation through stories of people. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Mario Rosetti, ISI Foundation, Torino, uh, which is a, an institute for research in uh, data analytics, data science, and complex system science. Hello, Europe. <laughs> Thanks for having me. My name is Pedro. I'm an entrepreneur from Spain. I only have one mission. I'm helping my friends from MIT set up the network of young innovators under 35 in Europe. So I need to talk to all of you, accelerators, incubators, investors, universities, everything. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sofia Benjumea, co-founder of Spain Startup, and our mission is to foster the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Spain. And our main activity at the moment is the organization of the South Summit, through which we want to show the world how bright the South is, putting together the best startups from Southern Europe and Latin America, together with international investors and the corporations that are in such need of innovation and need to interact with the startups. So thank you for having us here. Hello, my name is Bas Kotrink. Uh, I'm with TNO. TNO is, uh, I think, the second largest uh, research and technology organization in Europe, and I'm working on, in particular, on high-tech acceleration. Hello, I'm Gennaro Galdo from Everest, uh, Italia. I uh, actually work in the telco industry, leading. Uh, ICT innovation and transformation uh, program across all Europe. Hello, I'm Nathalie Boulanger, uh, head of Orange Startup Ecosystem, and uh, we are founder partner, one of the founder partners of uh, the European Commission Initiative, a Startup Europe Partnership, to help startups scale up. Over there. Ciao, I'm Elena Plexida. I work for the Greek uh, permanent representation to the EU. I'm the Telecom Atasse. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Viktor Schober. I'm working for the Croatian permanent representation to the EU, and I'm covering telecom and transport as well. Thank you. Stefano Quintarelli, internet entrepreneur since uh, 1994 and now member of parliament. Hi, I'm Alex Giordano. I was founder of Ninja Marketing and now um, I represent uh, Rural Hub, a project of research working about uh, young startup involved in uh, rural communities and the food system. Hi, I'm Marcangelo Rocciolo. I'm editor in chief of Startup Italia, an Italian newspaper. And that's it. Hello, I'm Alessia Nivallo, Startup Italia blogger. Hello, my name is Santiago Massa, I have a the, uh, digital company and I work the government for San Marino, for digital uh, agency. Okay, cool. So just uh, we're giving our, a face behind the tweet account. Hello, Andrea Povolato uh, from Venice with IS Final. The, the company owned by the city council for the ICT. Hi, Sara De Nicolo, Twitter specialist. 
Hi, Martina Gorisavellini, Twitter specialist. Hi, um, this is Anna Testa. I'm working uh, for Telecom Italia, and today I'm also a Twitter specialist. Yes. Did I miss anyone? Hopefully not. Okay, so I just wanted to, to do this also at the cost to still in two minutes to each of our speakers because I think today is not about the speakers, it's about you. Because we have 50, 60 people in here that are really outstanding people from over Europe. And you can, you have the knowledge, the background, the experience. You see how many countries, how many fields, how many areas are represented today. I think you can really provide a good, high qualified contribution to the debate. So that's why I wanted to, to spend a few minutes just introduce each of you because it's all about networking. Okay, so uh, just the last thing I need to mention is the hashtag of, of this session. It is supposed to be DVWS3, Digital Venice Workshop 3. Don't pick up the wrong one because there will be an internal debate, so probably we have communicated the wrong one in the last days. So just use this one, please. And it's about to start. So first in line, Jessica Stacy from Nesta. You have your eight minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I guess I'm really looking forward to getting to the discussion part of today because it's such a great group of people out there. Um, and I think it will be a really useful workshop. Um, so my name is Jessica. I work at Nesta, which is a charitable foundation based in the UK. Um, and our focus is innovation. So we do policy and research. We have an investment fund and we also do grants programs all around innovation, also with a, a strong focus on social innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and Alberto asked me to come and speak today on some of the, the startup ecosystem data. So I guess to give a bit, bit of an introdu introduction and, and some, some numbers behind some of the topics that he talked through before. Um, so what I did is I sort of pulled out some of the, the information that's out there from various reports and um, put together some pretty pictures and graphs, but I'm not sure you'll all be able to see them. So I'll just try my best to talk my way through them. Um, so... Work. Yeah, so what I'm going to cover, um, a little bit about the big picture, why we're interested in digital startups, um, some stunt, uh, stats on funding and investment, um, a little bit about support, so mentoring and incubation propping up in this place, and finally, um, a, a nod towards the wider ecosystem, so um, just to chat very quickly about corporates, universities, and, and public policy, if I've still got enough time. So first of all, the big picture. So why, why does startups matter? I thought it would be useful to, I guess, take a step back. Um, and uh, it's a useful way of explaining it is through a, a project that we've been running at Nesta for the past couple of years that's been looking at high growth firms. And what we found out by, by studying the UK companies, that actually it's a very small percentage of companies, so just 7% of companies create the majority of jobs in the whole of the UK. And this is something that we've seen in, in other countries as well where this study has been replicated. And when we looked at that 7%, we found that actually uh, the high proportion of these companies are, are small. Um, and also a high proportion are young companies. So hence our interest in startups, because we think that if we can create uh, quality, so quality, not necessarily quantity, uh, in startups, that they can um, contribute disproportionately towards economic growth and job creation. Um, so what do we know about, I guess, the environment at the moment for, for starting up a new company? I'm afraid you probably won't see this very well, but these are some stats from the OECD entrepreneurship at a glance. And basically what they do is they, they track the number of um, new companies over time. And this, this graph starts at 2007 and it goes through to 2013. Um, and it's by no means perfect, but it's, it just shows an interesting picture in that We've obviously got a massive drop around sort of 2009 in the financial crisis. But what we're starting to see is in, in European companies is, a, I guess, a bit of a stabilization. So um, they're not quite up above um, pre-financial crisis times, but, but we are getting to, a, I guess, a point now where, where we're, it's a more stable environment for, for starting up a new firm. 
in amongst this, we're, we're seeing, um, I guess, digital technology is, is reaching a really exciting point in terms of um, the innovations that we're seeing. Uh, and, it, and it's showing in, in lots of different sectors. Um, so I thought some interesting stats here. Um, basically, digital technologies have accounted for more than 21% um, of GDP growth in the world's most advanced economies over the past five years. So I'm looking back because I can't remember all these figures. <laughs> um, the European digital economy is expected to grow seven times faster um, overall than uh, the total EU GDP in coming years. And finally, a figure from the Boston Consulting Group um, which estimates that the digital economy will contribute a total of 4.2 trillion to G uh, the G20's total GDP um, by 2016. So we've got a more stable environment for starting up, um, matched with uh, innovations in digital technology, which I think provides a really ripe environment today for, for discussing digital startups. Uh, so what do we know about where these startups are? So this is from the European Commission ICT Polls of Excellence. And, and what it shows is that if we look at ICT activity, uh, we're, we're getting clustering. So we're, there's some strong centres around London and Paris and Munich. But I think, like, interestingly, there's also some smaller clusters that are happening outside of the main economic cities. And I think this is a, a development that maybe we can explore um, in, in the workshop. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to whiz quickly through some investment stats but not spend too much time on this because we've got several experts on the panel. Um, so I won't delve into this because these are EBAN statistics and I'm sure Candice will talk a bit more about that. But it's basically to show the proportion of um, early stage finance in Europe and how a large majority is coming from business angels, 26% from early stage VC funds, and a small but growing number, 1% from equity crowdfunding. Um, this is a, a chart from Nesta's Unchaining Investment Report, which compare, um, compared VC activity in the States um, with UK and continental Europe. And what it shows there, I think the red is the US, blue is the UK, and green is continental Europe, um, is that uh, VC activity in Europe uh, and the UK is improving, but it's still lagging behind where, we, where the US is at the moment. Um, so I mentioned crowdfunding, that 1%. Um, it's, it's a small element, but it is growing. So uh, these are figures from Resolution. Um, they recorded 2.7 billion raised in total um, uh, globally in 2012. Um, and uh, this figure is taking off in Europe, so that's 900 and 45 million uh, in total uh, raised in Europe, and that's, but that's all ventures, so not just early stage. And they think this uh, figure has probably doubled in 2013. Um, in terms of networks um, and incubation and acceleration, we're seeing a huge growth in the number of accelerator programs um, across Europe. Um, <laughs> Uh, so here's some figures um, from CDB, which were created for the, uh, the Accelerator Assembly, and they tracked 53 um, incidences of accelerators in, in Europe. This is sticking to a kind of quite a strict definition. And if you, you broaden this out a bit more, as um, Telefonica did in the report, you see a much wider spread of um, accelerator and incubation support happening across Europe. Um, in terms of the wider ecosystem, I thought, if I've got time still... <laughs> two minutes, <laughs> was very quickly into what corporates are doing now in this space. Um, so uh, how are they engaging with startups in Europe? Well, we're seeing a lot more corporates um, getting involved in accelerator and incubation activities, either sponsoring or, or running their own programs. And we're also seeing an increase in the number of corporates getting involved in venture capital. So this is a chart from CB Insights. Um, and on the far left side, so 2009, um, corporates were involved, so this is looking at, sorry, the top 100 um, VC, uh, VC backed tech deals. In 2009, 22% of those deals involved corporates, um, and now in 2013, that figure is almost doubled, so I think it's 39% of, um, of these top 100 deals in, involved corporate venture capital. Um, a quick uh, not towards universities, because I think this is a, another interesting um, topic that we could include in the workshop this afternoon, is, is kind of looking at the role that they play in the startup ecosystem. 
So this is a new report that's just come out from MIT and um, the Skull Tech Initiative. And what they were doing is they surveyed a small panel of experts um, on the universities that they thought had contributed or created kind of innovative tech ecosystems. Um, and what it shows is people still think of um, MIT and Stanford University as being the main universities there. But there's, there's a good showing of European um, universities in that chart there. And the study itself then goes on and, and includes a number of cases studies, which I think we could probably have a look at to see how we could replicate some of the activities. Sorry? Okay. Uh, so there, the third one there, we've got University of Cambridge, Imperial College of London, University of Oxford, um, ETH Zurich, TU Munich, and Sweden, KTH. I'm from New Zealand, and so I'm really rubbish, and I probably don't know all these names properly, so forgive me. Um, and finally, I think this will come out uh, again further in, in the other um, speaker presentations, but I thought I'd just quickly draw out some of the topics that have come out of public policy debates in this area. Um, but we will talk about that more. I've been told to stop, but I hope that at least has given a kind of... Uh, a bit of a whistle-stop tour about um, how to add a bit of colour to some of the, the conversations that we're going to be having this afternoon. Thank you. So thank you, Je Jessica. Sorry for abruptly interrupting you. When you're talking about my favourite topic, the Startup Europe Partnership, I'm sorry, so, you know, I'm neutral today. Anyway, so I've been told that you back at the back of the room you cannot see the screen, right, over there. So we have two options. Option number one is you can move forward because it's free. And option number two that we activate also that screen, but you can no longer have the tweeting uh, published. So I will propose for option number one, let's join uh, here together. So we became a big group working together. So speaker number two in my list is Mike, are you ready? No. If you like. Mike Baxter. Hi. I don't have any slides. Uh, my name is Mike Butcher. I am a journalist. This is my day job. And um, for, for, for kicks, I help start up a co-working space in London called Tech Hub, which has now got nine, I think, nine uh, spaces around the UK uh, internationally. Uh, and yesterday it launched a new space in Bangalore in India because we think that Asia and India and China are very important. Um, and I wrote a story recently about how I thought that the EU was spending far too much money on stupid things to do with startups. And I can tell you a bit about that later. Um, I mean, I'm in exalted company. These guys are amazing. But Candice Johnson, I'm a huge fan, by the way. Um, so please take everything I say with a pinch of salt. My main thing is that I'm a journalist. So I'm sort of, you guys are all playwrights, and I get to be the critic which is great fun. Um, but I just thought I've got uh, what I've been um, rattling out is what I call the... Uh, uh, hello. Nice to see you. Um, uh, the 12 apostles of uh, startup initiatives in Europe. Um, so real, real simple. Number one, improving tech skills and education. So this is all very obvious. Now, um, Alberto wanted me to just say a couple of things about what's going on out there. What's going on out there is absolute fucking chaos, okay? Basically, masses and masses of kids out there are getting code and destroying and creating and destroying and creating over and over again. So it's, and this is happening everywhere. Now, some of the smartest people and the biggest startups are being created as we speak in back bedrooms. Cut the Rope was created by two brothers in Moscow in their spare bedroom. Now it's a billion-dollar company. It's taken no outside investment. 
Now, I'm not sure what we all think about Russia by now, right now, but I'm just trying to kind of uh, uh, tell you about you know, the stuff that's going on. And whatever happens he here today, whatever we decide, that will continue to happen. So technology continues to march on, whether we do it or not. But the only way we're really going to compete, especially with our neighbors in Eastern Europe, uh, the ones who are now going to become part of Europe, um, who are all, you know, ex-Soviet missile silo programmers, and they still have an education system built around chess and mathematics and engineering, is those are the kinds of education systems we must embrace. We cannot have education systems like the one they have in France, where 60,000 psychology students graduate every year. We're not doing anything with these psychology graduates, okay? These are not the jobs of the future. Sorry to be controversial. Second, uh, our, our traditional educational institutions are not geared for the future. We must uh, basically bypass them, or they need to catch up on their own, do something, throw money at them or something. But we, our edu traditional education systems are not fit for purpose, and therefore we must invest uh, and we must encourage the creation of massive online learning programs, because that's how kids learn today. When my kids want to learn about something that today, they go to YouTube, right? They don't ask Daddy. They go and look it up on YouTube, and they get a video, and they watch a video. And then when eventually they're a bit older, they will basically go and start reading Wikipedia as well. Uh, we need to increase access to capital. Uh, we need to, now, how do we do that? We need to incentivize uh, angel investors uh, people with money, far too much pro uh, money in Europe is locked up in property. Uh, far too many p rich people in France or in Italy uh, or in Berlin or in London sitting on property, basically doing nothing with it and creating no economy for the future. Uh, this is just bricks. It's got not, nothing to do with talent and nothing to do with the future. Um, so we need to incentivize those people with money to release it to people with brains, and, uh, and, we, and the, some things like the uh, SEIS scheme in the UK has been particularly successful at encouraging high net worth individuals to unlock money at this early stage of investing. I'm probably going far too slowly here. I'll speed up. Procurement laws. Governments need to uh, rejig their procurement laws to enliven uh, small businesses, so that in a way that basically like government should act like an API, and an API which small businesses and high growth businesses can plug into uh, using data. Um, we need to make sure that our European institutions are not spending money on uh, things which have nothing to do with the actual business environment such as hackathons, which are easily sponsored by commercial organizations and things like that. Many of our modern our data laws are antiquated and they're not geared for open data because open data actually creates startups. A company just exited in the UK London Stock Exchange for $950 million uh, or euros or whatever it was, around a billion of one of those currencies, called Zoopla. Zoopla is a property website, which basically took open data, turned it into contextual data around property, and then created a, a very big company. Now, that open data needs to be released. Uh, our, some of our current reg regulation are, are a joke. The right to be forgotten has been an absolute disaster. Uh, and um, and uh, it's law written by judges who got no fucking clue about the internet. New net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality, please write net neutrality down because if in the future content companies like Netflix or um, cable companies, uh, record labels, all of these companies will be wanting to shut down telecoms, communicate telcos that allow you access to a new innovative startup. And that will stop innovation. Net neutrality laws, if implemented, will stop innovation. I can't say it clearer than that. Hacker is not a dirty word. Startup is not a dirty word. And also failure is not a dirty word. We need to make sure 
that small high growth companies are allowed to fail and, not, and, and entrepreneurs are not uh, told, uh, are not uh, have a, a, a massive uh, sudden personal debt or something like that. We need more exit markets. Uh, we need uh, routes to exit uh, so that uh, these smart entrepreneurs can uh, do well, become wealthy, and then they then reinvest in the ecosystem, creating exactly the cycle that exists in Silicon Valley today. Uh, and lastly, we need to get rid of the mafia. And why do I say that? I'm talking about the mafia of the telcos. The telcos are far too in much in control. Access to broadband, access to high, high, brand, high bandwidth, fast broadband should be treated like the way we should treat the mafia. The Pope should basically come out and say that these telcos are, should, should just leave. I'm not, I'm not joking. It's really as simple as that. Uh, because broadband, in the same way that Christianity talks about the water of life, broadband is the, is the water of life to startups. And we need very, very cheap access to very, very fast broadband, because otherwise we'll be living in a black and white world. Simple. Okay, thanks very much. No. Si. Si. Okay. Good. So, Mike Batcher, thank you. Uh, next eight minutes to Praveen Pragnotti, European Investment Fund. If someone in Europe can really do something, it is uh, them. So, there's still seven minutes, so if you are probably the most powerful person in this room. So good afternoon, everyone. Do you hear me up there, the back? Great. Uh, so uh, my name is Praveen Paranjodi. I work for the venture capital team in the European Investment Fund. A quick show of hands. So how many of you are familiar with the European Investment Fund? OK, quite a few. And uh, how many of you are from corporates? A couple. All right. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the funding trends in Europe. So I'm going to start with a very brief introduction of who we are. So EIF is a public-private partnership. We are an European institution, but we also have private shareholders. We align ourselves with the policy, but we make the investment in the market-oriented means, means, meaning which we are actually very much aligned with the private investors in investing in the market. So we really have a look in the market perspective uh, from a private investor view. What do we need to do and what, sh what are we currently doing in terms of being having an efficient and sustainable market. So who we are, so uh, since 2000, we have been committing in the market. So we have committed about 4 billion in venture capital in the European market. We have invested about 250 VC funds and business angels, and we have about 100 VC funds actively investing currently in the market from our portfolio. So if you say that uh, the total number of VC funds currently in the market is around 120, 130, so that we are like in the 80% of the market at the moment. So we committed 600 million euros last year uh, that in about 25 VC funds. But more importantly, what I wanted to show you is really this cash flow. This is, this is simple arithmetic. We are investing a euro. We want two euros back. Venture capital is investing at 50 cents in a startup, and they want the startup to grow it to five euros. And then they want to return the money. The startup return the money to the venture capitalist. Venture capital return the money to us. Simple arithmetic, but it's really not working. We all know that. And if this is not working, there's not going to be a sustainable ecosystem. So let's start with that and cut it, cut it into pieces and see like where we are currently. So as you can see from the chart up there, the chart you see on to your left is EIF's chart. And what you see is on the European Venture Capital Association chart. So the first point I would like to make is it's pretty much representative of uh, the EF's data is pretty much representative of the European venture data. So what we see is the public funding is leading the way. So about 40% of the venture capitals 
are getting the public funding, what the FCA terms as government agencies. And we do have about 40% of private institutional investors investing in the market, but nobody is really leading the way. They want us to first sign up before they would have probably a serious look at it or else actually sign up. So it's meaning which nobody is really taking risks from the private institutional perspective. What we are seeing in terms of the trends is uh, from the venture funds, more and more specialized funds are coming, funds focused on financial technologies, business to business, big data, and very much core focused on core technologies. We have some good funds like Revolution Capital based out of Lyon in France, focused on robotics. We like that. We think there is a strong element in Europe for those kind of technologies. There's a lot of people working on good technologies. We need to back them up. So we, we are seeing increasingly funds like that. And more importantly, I want to get back to the point on private institutional investors. Why are they not coming before the government agencies, as they should? Uh, because it's, it's really, you know, even in the good funds, I'm not talking about funds that are not doing that well, but even in good funds, they want the government agencies to take a lead. And why is that? The reason is you're always taking a rear view mirror on saying that what happened in the market in the last 10 years, we have not been getting really any kind of returns, which is true. I told you, you know, I alluded before that really there is no returns right now in the market. But you cannot really analyze venture capital looking back. It's a rear view analysis at this point is not really working. What is working for us from our data is this. So we haven't published the performance data, so I'm just going to take something that's kind of really uh, hinting on where our performance is currently. So we started committing in 2000. We achieved X percent net IRR. And then in 2004, we actually started grading the funds and said, what are the A graded funds? What are the B graded funds? That what, we are not really doing these funds because of the policy angle, but we really like these funds. And then the net returns are about three, per, three times than that of what, what happened in 2000. This is only the ICT VC performance. And then you go to 2008. This is interesting, really. We saw some of the entrepreneurs, repeat entrepreneurs, setting up funds, high quality funds, and high quality uh, companies coming out. And our returns are 6x than what we got in 2000. So if you're, if you're in 2008, if the corporates and the private institutional investors are saying that we haven't seen the returns, so we're not really investing, then we're really re missing out on good vintages out there. Because if you're looking back from 2008, there has not been good returns. So you really have to look forward. That's something for the corporates here to take, take home as well. So what this tells is uh, everybody is talking about the cost reduction in starting a startup. So we are, uh, there are estimates that 90% cost reduction in, because of the cloud technologies, because of the open source communities and so on in starting a startup. But what this hints is, uh, between 2000 and 2013, the cost of building a business has not changed much. So you start a startup at very low cost, but building a startup costs almost the same money, about 4 million euros on average, if you look at it. So this is a very important point when you're talking about venture. So venture is still important, but starting off is easier. So from the venture capital perspective, it's really the ICT which is dominant. In terms of the geography, there are no surprises. Really, the UK, Germany, and France are leading all the way. And in terms of the venture fundraising, how have they performed? They had had a slight increase in fundraising. They have about four billion. But this is compared to the US, which actually, in 2013, went down in terms of the total fund raised, as you can see. So we are not far off from the market. So overall, the venture capitalists are having a positive fundraising environment. And one, one point that I want to highlight in this slide is really about uh, the secondary funds or annexed funds. The venture capital model, for those of you who know, we're talking about 10 plus 2 years, typically 12 years. It's not working. Startups take longer to exit. And there is, uh, Mike alluded to the exit market. There is an issue in the exit market. So what we are seeing is more and more funds actually raising annexure funds to invest in the startups that have grown successful. And traditionally, the US VCs come in the market and take the value when they actually grew up. So now we are seeing some of the European funds doing that, and we are supporting some of the funds currently. From the startup perspective, really, the financing as well is, hasn't changed much. So there has been a modest increase this year.
my last point here is uh, what is happening in the stage of the startup investments is the seed stage is the seed stage is re risk is really taken by the government agencies, incubators, accelerators. VCs are the moving later stage in a sense. You know, you need to have a product, sometimes some revenue. So this is very important to make the public programs that we have there, which is kicking off the startups as simple as possible, so that you're actually financing the good ideas out there. And then I would actually agree with Mike's statement that it should be demand driven. You shouldn't really finance every startup out there. There should be good startups that should pull the, pull the financing. So you shouldn't put the financing surplus out there, but rather there should be demand surplus which should be financing. With this, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Bharvin. I think this is a pretty good point so about the, the need to focus on the best ones not just because we are selecting a few, but because we want to create a better ecosystem. This is a pretty good point. So all the, the stresses we are making on the, the scale-ups, I think it's pretty important. So next in line is Candace Johnson. Hey, Candace. Yeah, okay. So um, I, I do have to just... Uh, also tell our friend from the EIF that the angel investors are also taking very big risk in the seed investment. <laughs> okay, um, so I'd I'd like to kind of make this in in three um, in three parts. Uh, the first part is that I've just kind of you know come as Alberto said to become the president of Ebon. It's a very funny position for me because I'm an entrepreneur. And I took the position because I think that, you know, I think we can change Europe and I think we can change the world. And so that's fun. And what are the three things that I think we need to do to make that happen? First of all, I do think that we need, as I kind of, I actually sang at the, if you can believe it, at the round policy with the president of uh, Europe uh, and uh, Mr. Renzi and everybody. I said, celebrate, celebrate. You know, Europe has got to celebrate its success stories. We have so many wonderful success stories, and I'm going to share a couple that I've done. Um, and I want everybody to share because, you know, we have to create this mentality of success. And every time somebody does something good, it's great. And the second thing we have to do is we can't say this success story came from London, or this success story came from Berlin, or this success story came from uh, Lyon. We have to say it came from Europe. Nobody in America says this success story came from Alabama, or this success story came from Tennessee. And believe me, they do. I know. I'm American. So we also need, and our friend here just mentioned that too, we need to have private-led and private sector investment, all right? We, I mean, God forbid, I remember the first time that the Sofia Business Angels got a quote-unquote subsidy from the French government. We were one of the first 10 business angels in Europe, and we got this subsidy. And we all looked at each other and said, oh my God, you know, what are we going to do with this subsidy? It was embarrassing. We were all serial entrepreneurs. We were all investing in uh, new entrepreneurs. What we did do with the money is we started a venture academy to get uh, to help uh, young entrepreneurs go from being almost investment ready to being investment ready. So private sector and private led. Nobody in America is waiting for the government, God forbid, to say, okay, well now we're going to invest in here and we're going to invest in that. No, we've got to be private sector led and then when we think that it's a good idea, we can let the government get in on our good jobs and our good deals, but only if we think it's a good idea, because we may want to keep the money for ourselves, right? Okay. And, the, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, my father was a venture capitalist. He was an entrepreneur in the United States. He worked with, he was one of the first Kleiner Perkins people. And he then went in 1990 to Israel. And he is known as the father of the Israeli venture capital community. And what he always told us at home is a nation is not a nation until it invests in its next generation and in its youth. And, you know, so 
and, and I'm talking about Europe, we have got to invest in Europe. Now, the one thing that I do think we can work with the government on is creating this European investment structure for startups. And that has to be, you know, I was Julie Meyer. Uh, I was her first investor in Ariadne Capital. She's doing this thing called Entrepreneur Country. We're going to work with her, the EBON, because we're going to be the global founding partner of that, because we think that this entrepreneur country, this investor country, where all of the tax incentives, the employment incentives, the exit, hey, let's not forget the exit, because that's really important. If you've made a lot of money on one of your investments, you want to make certain and get as much money as you can back so that you can then invest in the next company. So we want to work on this European infrastructure. Now I'm supposed to be, you know, talking about the Startup Investors Manifesto, which I'm very happy to do, but, you know, but, so anyway, I'm very happy that we signed, we got it signed by Neely Cruz, and, and, and she's been absolutely wonderful, and I'll just go, okay, I have one, bar. so you know what, I'm going to switch to what I really think we need to do. Um, let me see, where do we do? We go here. One, two. Okay, so you can, you can all see that, we, you know, uh, increase early stage from, you know, 7.5 billion to 15 billion by 2017. And uh, then, you know, generate 1.5 million new jobs. You know what? And, um, you know, and, and we have to increase funds and we have to do all of this and inspire co-investment. No, we have to inspire a private investment. So anyway, so that's what I'm supposed to talk about. Now, let me talk about the startup that I started 30 years ago. Astra, SES, Astra, the world's largest satellite system. One woman and one angel investor, my friend, um, who he had the money, I had the guts. <laughs> anyway, you know, we started it, it was not allowed to have a private satellite dish, it was not allowed to have a private satellite system, there were no private broadcasters. Within five years, we launched our first satellite. Within seven years, we were Europe's largest satellite system, and within 12 years, we were the world's largest satellite system. Um, we did our first, we, we did a joint venture with Russia, we launched our first uh, Occidental satellite on, uh, on Proton. We created the world's largest satellite system. And you know what? Now, Europe also has some amazing startup stories. Raspberry Pi, everybody here, raise your hand. Raspberry Pi, you know about Raspberry Pi? Okay, Raspberry Pi is enabling kids to go and program for 25 euros. And not only that, uh, I, I helped my friends, Herman Hauser and Jack Lang, uh, to put Raspberry Pi into Arabic. I was on May 17th in Lebanon in the Syrian refugee camps because we will be bringing the, um, the Raspberry Pi to all of the Syrian refugee camps in the Arab world. Um, we're, uh, space, we're going to talk about what we think is important. Obviously, you know, the economist named me the saddle lady, so, you know, I think space is really big. Uh, two young New Zealanders and I have started OwnSat, Oceania Women's Network Satellite, in New Zealand using European technology. Um, this is ASA and NASA. It's the first laser light um, and satellite optical network in the world, creating a meshed network backbone for the internet connectivity, covering all of the spaces that you see there that are not covered, blanketing with laser and satellite across the world, and then providing such things as Google and the Loon, um, the backbone internet con connectivity, for them to do their balloons. So you know what? Everything is possible. And we just need to get together and think big, think success, and work your dairy years off. Thanks. Bye. Perfect on time. So. So it's up to me, so I'd be shorter than the others, just to, to set up the example. So, if you can quickly. As I say, now we are going to move the focus. We are talking about investments, we're talking about uh, investment from, from the European Investment Fund and from a business census perspective, there are two components of the same puzzle. And uh, now I'm talking, we're going to move a bit the focus to try to understand how to move forward. And now we're going to present an initiative that we as Mind the Bridge are leading on behalf of the European Commission. It's called Startup Europe Partnership. 
So what we are here about? So let's start from the problem. What kind of problem do we have in Europe? Can I say that? And I've been said also from Praveen, I've been saying from probably from everyone in this room. So I would just say no exit, no party. So all the things that we are putting together into the startup ecosystem, all the fuel that we are putting together in the startup ecosystem, meaning all the capital that has been invested, will be wasted or partially wasted if you're not able to produce exits or large corporates. So if you look at these slides, probably the, 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 the list is not complete. We can discuss about that. We can tell everything. But this is the list of the unicorns. The source is the Wall Street Journal. I'm from the US or a bit partial, probably. But if you look at the list of the 20, 33 companies, young companies are able to reach the 1 billion valuation, the European companies are three. The problem is not that the majority of them are from US, we know. The problem is that five of them, and definitely ranking better than European ones, are from China. So we are not just have a gap with the US, but now we are still not the second one in the list. And so we need to, to focus our attention dramatically or positively to what we call the scale-ups. So we are trying to as Startup Europe punish also to do a mapping as a site, to, to understand what we have. Because again, as Akanda said, uh, we, we can't just complain. We need also to take a look at what we have of good things, that we have done of damn good things in here. And there are plenty of them. So it's true, maybe we have just three companies in the Unicorn Club, but we are listing uh, a lot of companies that are entering what we can call the Mini Unicorn Club. So companies are raised over $100 million that are scaling up widely and are candidate to become the next unicorns. And then we are also listed, and this is just a partial analysis, we are still finding every week tons of company. We have at least 1,000 plus company in Europe that were able to raise more than $1 million. Raising $1 million doesn't mean anything, doesn't mean that you are successful, but it's the first step in the right direction, the first step in the direction of scaling up. Most of them will fail, but some of them will make it. So there are some good ingredients that we can definitely work on. Secondly, we are also trying to map what are called the exits. I'm a bit focused from exit. The, the Silicon Valley part of me is dramatically focused on exits. So today we just published a report, SAP Monitor, just we're presenting some data about the European exit. So the good news that we found it out that at least 200 exits in the ICT sector in Europe in the last three years. 200. It's not Silicon Valley, not at all, but it's still something. And we have uh, at least 30 companies, there are more than that, because we are obviously this is just a portion of that, that were able to be acquired for more than $100 million. That is something. We got at least five IPO over $1 billion. Yes, U.S. is the typical exit door. 40% have been acquired from U.S. company, but 53% are being acquired in Europe. So they're scaling up in here. So, Startup Europe Partnership, what we are trying to do? So we believe that we need no longer to focus on the startups. At least someone else could do it, not us. We want to focus on the scale-ups. We want to focus on the best European companies, the ones that we are growing, and help them to speed up the scale-up process. How we can plan to do that? Putting together the starters of the world, meaning the startups, with the scalers of the world, that are the large corporates. We are going to create a matching platform when we put together the best European startups at European level, not from single country, from all countries, to the best corporates at European and not just European level. With a precise goal, to have them to scale up through procurement, investments and acquisition, period. Obviously, this is not a uh, one-man one -man effort. This is a joint effort. We have corporate members. We have uh, proudly supported since the beginning by Telefonica, Orange, BBBA. But the good news is that we have other corporates that are joining. We have Telecom Italia that joins one month ago. 
Unipol Group, the second insurance group in Italy, joined two weeks ago. Today, Microsoft announces to enter the partnership. We are working with uh, the most prestigious universities because it's just about not just to, to do things, but also to understand what are the best practices. We're working with Nesta. We're working with everyone that wants to contribute to create best practice on the top of that. And then we're working with all the investors, accelerators, because we need to find out the best European startups to put them in front of key decision makers from the corporate world. That's it. Five minutes. And uh, talking about corporates, I think that I have a corporate around the table that we cannot miss because it's large enough. It's Google, so is a Vidra. Thank, Thank you. you. Is everyone awake? <laughs> I got the graveyard shift after lunch, uh, after a few speakers, so I decided uh, I'm not going to present the slides. We can put the title slide there uh, as background, but I just want to talk to you about three things. And first of all, as a way of introduction, my name is Izzy Vidra. I'm the head of Google for Entrepreneurs Europe. And um, I also started Google's first physical hub for startups called Campus London. And you may have heard of Campus London. If not, a lot of the examples that I'm going to give are from our experience with Campus London. And what I wanted to share with you today is what we see in the market and what we see looking forward in, in order to make startup hubs successful. So I promise there's only, only going to be three big things to remember. So we'll start with the first one. Um, so in order to, to make startup hubs successful, I think that there's three conditions that need to happen. And one, the first one splits into two, and that's creating the right environment. So if you are from a smaller city or smaller startup ecosystem, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, we're not all from Silicon Valley. People in Silicon Valley, or some, some people feel like there's something in the water in Silicon Valley, and that's the only place that you can be innovative. But we all know it's not true. So there's innovation happening everywhere, all over the world, and people are trying to disrupt industries using technology, and we need to nurture it, but people focus too much on trying to recreate Silicon Valley, so we're failing before we're beginning. So creating the right environment is crucial, and I divide it into two. One is the physical environment. I know it sounds, uh, it sounds a little bit uh, archaic, you know, physical environment, like why do we need physical, everything is digital, and I believe that clusters are not made of buildings, they're made of people, but creating the right physical environment is crucial for entrepreneurs to be successful, especially at the top of the funnel, at the early stage. So at Campus London, we provide a space for entrepreneurs to come together. Um, we work with partners like Tech Hub, Seedcamp, uh, Startup Weekend, etc. And these physical environments create an open source system or an API for entrepreneurs to plug into. You want to host an event, you can do it. You want to work, you want to have a place to work and meet other entrepreneurs, you can do it, etc., etc. Um, and I'm going to talk about numbers a little bit later on. So the second part of environment is actually the, what I call the opposite from physical environment. Maybe we call it spiritual environment. Okay, and this is an environment of pay it forward. It's creating an environment of education and learning and creating an environment that is diverse where everyone feels welcome to be an entrepreneur. So if you don't know the data, you can look it up, but it's statistically proven that diverse teams make better decisions. But in tech, I think in startups, we have a huge problem that we need to address also in Europe, and that's diversity. And the number of women entrepreneurs, I think the industry average, we're talking about 8%. Uh, that's a, a generous average. It's probably closer to, to 5%. At Campus London, we managed to get 25% women participation. That's because we work really hard at it. So when you're trying to create environment in your local startup ecosystem, make sure that there's diversity and create this uh, environment of education and pay it forward, which is really creating a culture which is kind of like bringing the idea of Silicon Valley to your local startup ecosystem. I don't want to touch too much about education because it's a whole huge topic, but I actually um, want to echo Mike that spoke earlier about people trying to learn stuff and going to YouTube. And I believe that most startup education happens outside of traditional, traditional education systems. People don't learn about entrepreneurship in university and they, they don't learn about it in high school. They teach themselves, they go to events, and this is what I think corporates can do to nurture more entrepreneurship in the community. So we talked about environment. One thing you have to remember, very simple. The second thing is actually numbers or density. 
So it's not enough to have all the components of the startup ecosystem. You know, you need to have entrepreneurs, you need to have angels, you need to have VCs, you need to have corporates to, to buy them or to buy from them. Um, and you need to have all of this, but it's not enough to have the components, you need to have enough of them. Silicon Valley traditionally attracted all the best minds in the world to one small geographical place to create companies, and that created a huge advantage for them. And in Europe, we are all dispersed, you know, there's like, 26 different languages and we have different currencies and different regulations and it doesn't make it easy for us to create density. So I'm just going to say it here. I think that we need to stop obsessing about creating valleys and we need to start obsessing about creating bridges between these valleys and you do this by creating density of network. So to give you an example of how we've done this at campus, again, one building, East London, 200 startups working from it every day. In 2013, we held 1,133, sorry, 1,133 startup events. Most of them are free, hosted by the community, organized by the community. That brought more than 200,000 people to talk together in one place about startups, about big data, about open source, about social networking, et cetera, et cetera. And this sort of density of network creates magic. So if you want to create a vibrant startup ecosystem in your neck of the woods, you have to think about this density of network as a critical component. Um, finally, the third element is actually a function of the previous two. So it's not enough to have the right environment, physical environment, spiritual environment, and the density of network. You, know, you can do that in a very small scale. For example, it happens in Trento, Italy. You know, there's a program called the Startup Peaks, I think, and they managed to create incredible um, density of network and environment in a very specific place, but that's not enough. What you need is this third element, which the more stronger community you have and the higher density, you create this elusive element of serendipity, which is the magic dust. And how do you create serendipity? You create serendipity by bringing smart, passionate people together on a consistent basis and giving them a platform to collaborate. A little bit like this, you know, we have 50 great people from all the whole ecosystem. When you were introducing yourselves, I wish I had an opportunity to shake everyone's hand and learn more about what you're doing, but we need to create more opportunities like this, more serendipity for entrepreneurs to be able to break through and grow their companies, sell their ideas, pitch their ideas, get investment, get partnerships, etc. So at campus, I can tell you that one of the ways that we do this is by um, a simple concept of office hours or bringing together, together people with knowledge to people who want this knowledge. One way that we do it is through Google office hours where Googlers come to campus once a week and they mentor startups on a specific topic. It's every week, it's the same time, same day. It's, it's Fridays from 10 to 12. And every week we change the topic. Last year alone, we had over a thousand mentorship sessions between startups and, and Googlers at campus. So this is one building in East London, to, just to go back to, to that point. So creating serendipity comes in many ways. We also do this uh, by matching investors and entrepreneurs, and we do this by bringing together um, smart people on different verticals and putting a focus on a vertical or on an industry, whether it's like hardware, education, fashion, fintech, food, you name it. So in conclusion, and I'm getting, uh, I'm getting the nod here, um, I think that Silicon Valley may think that they have something special in the water, but us Europeans can be sure that we have much better wine and beer, and we can be innovative outside of Silicon Valley. And if you fulfill these three conditions, you're going to be able to create a successful startup ecosystem in your neck of the woods. And if we're able to work together and build the bridges between these valleys, I think we can really uh, put our first uh, best leg forward and create a strong entrepreneurship and startup ecosystem in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Izzy. Uh, so next in line is uh, Isidro Lazo Balestreros. European Commission, Startup Euro, the real man behind all this is Isidro. So thank you, Isidro, for being here. And uh, yours, eight, seven minutes. Thank you, Alberto, for your kind words. Okay, thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. I think this is a very important day for us. It's not only because of the presentations we are seeing now, it's also because of this Digital Venice Declaration. And hopefully, if this is endorsed by all the head of the states of the member states of the European Union in the Council of October. 
nothing will be achieved if this is not endorsed in October. So this is just, I mean, we should not think that we have won anything by having this declaration endorsed by Prime Minister Renzi and Nelly Cruz, that of course, if my boss uh, Cruz is listening to me, of course, is very important, but what we actually need is all the member states endorsing that declaration. And this is a call for action to all of you here from the government, Stefano in particular, and the people from Italy, Italy presidency to ensure that this happens, that there's no water down during the process, that there are no excuses to postpone the decision to a later stage and the classical uh, Brussels tricks that Frederick from uh, Telefonica can, can very well explain. So my presentation is about celebration. And I think we have a lot to celebrate here in Europe. We, uh, I mean, maybe I'm going no, but it's good that you, you, you also said that because I thought I was going to be almost the only one. But you know what is this? Maybe you have read that in the Financial Times last Tuesday. So not um, last, week, last Tuesday. You know what is this? You might know many of the, of the names there. Yandex, Skype, King, Spotify, Robio, Criteo, Habito, etc., etc. So these are the unicorns of Europe. This is the result of this of a study from GP Bullhound that was challenged by an article in TechCrunch, not by Mike. I mean, he would have loved to write that article, but because he's very controversial. But in this particular case, it was not him. It was some, someone else that said Europe is not able to create one billion plus companies. And this is the answer. Yes, Europe is capable to do that. Has created 31 billion plus tech firms since 2000. You know how many the states have created following the same methodology? Because someone might say, well, maybe it's not 30, it's more, it's less, but following the same methodology in the states, they have created in the same, from, from 2004, not from 2000, 39. So it's 30 versus 39. So we are not so bad. But who knew this before this study published one week ago? I didn't know. I assume almost none of you knew about this. So we have, we have a lot of good reasons to celebrate. And we have to celebrate that. And we have to see also why this is concentrated in very few countries. And someone said, what is Berlin? Well, what is Berlin? I don't see Berlin there. And these are facts. These are evidences. This is not the noise that they create in the media. No, these are facts, evidences, strong data. So what is there? It's UK. But these 11 are, by no means, the majority are not in, in London. They are in Manchester, they are in Scotland, they are in many places. They don't create noise. They don't go to the media and they shout how good we are. We are. It's London, it's Berlin, but you see, who are the ones who are delivering? So we have to pay attention to these environments that are not so obvious, Sweden, Finland, the Nordics have been able to create six out of 30. Six. Uh, which is the population between Sweden and Finland? I don't know. 20 million so in total? Yeah, maybe even less. So, you know, we have a lot of, to celebrate. We have good examples that we have to, to, to try to copy. I will go quickly here. We have a lot of excellent ecosystems in Europe. Here we have Cambridge. was mentioned before also by, by Jessica. Well, Cambridge, only Cambridge, I have to uh, caveat here, I'm fellow in Cambridge University, so I am a bit biased here, but these are, these are, this is data. I got the data because I'm fellow there. So in Cambridge, only in Cambridge, there are 14 1 billion companies. Only in Cambridge. Did you know that? I didn't know before becoming fellow. They have one company of more than 10 billion Euros, uh, dollars and one of more than 20 billion. And you know this? 80% eight per, eight of the European VC money is there. I, there were people here the other day with me uh, last Thursday in Cambridge, in Cambridge Angels, and then, the, I mean, they were amazed. I think Emilio Corchado was there. As, and, I mean, they were simply amazed of the ecosystem that is there. You cannot find anything like that. We have to celebrate that. We have to say, to see, to analyze why this is so successful and try to, to, to copy the best, to copy, but always adapting to the local characteristics. So it's good to shout, it's good to speak up, it's good to do a lot of media buzz 
fine, but we had to, to, to be guided by the evidences. So we have only two minutes. So more strong and positive things is the, the, the app economy in Europe is flourishing. I mean, we see one put, uh, eight million is not jobs, it's workforce, because some of these are hobbyists, growing to 4.8 billion millions by 2018. No other sector in, in Europe has this potential of creating jobs. So here, a good reason to, 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 to celebrate and to, to focus here. Yeah, I, but, but we have areas also where we have to recognize we need actions. In the cycle, this I copy from Mike Butcher, um, paper that he prepared some time ago, in, this, in the virtual cycle, as he calls it, we have some big problems in Europe, the scale up, but essentially in exiting, in the liquidity events. In the, in the first slides I put, something that is written there, is that out of these 31 billion companies in Europe, very few of them has had an exit. And this is not good, because if we don't have an exit, then the investor doesn't get the return of his investment. If we don't have an exit, we don't have a serial entrepreneur reinvesting that money, like Marco Marinucci is doing here in Italy, for example. So we need exits so that we get second uh, uh, generation of entrepreneurs. And there are many initiatives in Europe tackling that, like the Mark 2.0 from Germany, Elite from London the Stock Exchange, the 50 from Tech City, and of course the Startup Europe partnership that goes in that direction. The answer of the commission is networks. Creating bridges, like uh, Izzy said. We don't have the money, we don't have billions and billions to put poor here. So we, this is the, our answer. And we are trying to add, uh, with this philosophy on, create, on networks, in these 12 components, sources, Mark Schuster and Brad, and Brad Feld, that makes the, uh, the, 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 the strong components of our uh, ecosystem. So this is where Startup Europe is working. It's working in all these areas, pool of founders, local capital, key events, access to great university, motivated champions like Alberto, uh, marquee uh, local uh, companies, second time entrepreneurs, etc. And our answer is this. It's very, very complex. A lot of things, if you go to our website, startupeurope.eu, you may get lost because it's a lot of things that we are uh, doing. We have tried to structure more and more, but still it's a lot of things that we are doing. So please, and there's also this, this, this is the last slide. I just wanted to put it because I know it's, it's money and it's also something that is of interest of the people. So we have, we are just spending currently 10 million for ecosystem builders. So this has nothing to do to give money directly to grants or organizing hackathons or those kind of things is uh, following the line of, of Mike. But it's directly uh, giving money to accelerators or et cetera, the real ones, to, to have more uh, better infrastructure. Then there is up to 850 million for the startups directly in 2014. I have to say I'm not very keen on that. I don't, I don't think the, the role of the commission is to give money to uh, startups. I think I prefer more the approach of the European Investment Fund that they co-invest with professionals and the professionals are the ones giving the money. But in the Commission, we cannot do that. We are giving non-refundable grants to the startups. Every, all the information is here in startupeurope.eu and I suppose the slides will be put in the, in the internet and you will see there all the other things that you see are many that we are doing in, in the Commission. We are almost on time because we recuperated the, the delay. So the last uh, five minutes, I'm stealing one minute to each of the last speakers. But I'm really happy to, to pass the mic to Elena Favilli. So I'd like to give uh, the voice at the end to, first of all, a startupper. Secondly, a female startupper. Thirdly, a startup, an Italian startup that found out its way in the most competitive startup ecosystem in the world that is Silicon Valley. And so I remember we met the first time, probably in 2008, in Turin. I, uh, honestly, her presentation was pretty confu confused. But uh, I noticed a spark in her eyes, and Francesca Scavallo eyes, this is our co-founder, that told me that these girls were supposed to make something big just need a bit of help. And so starting from uh, Turin 28, uh, four, six years later, 
11 anyway. Uh, they did a lot of, uh, or, uh, they moved their way around along, and, and now I think they are some, they, they are reached something, not still final, but they did something. So I think this experience could be, could be interesting. So five minutes for you, and then uh, we will wrap it up. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about my experience as a startup founder in the US, and particularly in Silicon Valley. Um, I started Timbuktu, uh, well, I started working on Timbuktu in 2010 in Italy after receiving a grant from uh, Telecom Italia. And, and with that, um, with those 20,000 euro, I created my first prototype of, a, of the, our first product that was um, um, the first iPad magazine for kids officially launched in the App Store uh, that year. Um, in 2012, I moved with my co-founder to San Francisco after winning the Mind the Bridge startup competition in Milan. And we moved to, um, to California because we wanted to find a place, uh, we wanted to find investors, first of all, <laughs> to keep going. And we wanted to find a place where we could uh, accelerate our growth as entrepreneurs. And indeed, after um, two months after our arrival in, in San Francisco, we, um, we found our first institutional investor in Dave McClure. And we were selected and accepted um, into his um, accelerator program in Mountain View 500 Startups. Um, and then a few months later, we raised our, our first round of, of financing, and, and, and the company was officially established in the U.S., which is and it's still based in, in San Francisco. Um, so it might seem, I mean, our story um, might seem to reinforce the, the, the old stereotype that Silicon Valley is this startup paradise where anyone with talent and a great idea can make it. But I can tell you that it's not really true. Uh, and, and this is what I want to talk about today here. Um, the reality is um, that even in the US, uh, only 10%, about 10% of uh, VC money goes to women-led uh, startups. And that the vast majority of capital goes to a very particular type of founders. Uh, usually male, white male, middle class uh, programmers, engineers. Um, it's, it's what Mitch Kapoor calls mirrorocracy, uh, which is this very dangerous, <laughs> uh, very dangerous form of meritocracy, um, where those who advance faster are simply those who can mirror, who can best mirror uh, the status quo that's around them. So I think there's a, a lot of work to do in, 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 this, in this sense. And, and that's why the, the, the word that I've chosen for, for today's discussion is diversity. Because uh, despite its uh, propension and talent for innovation, and reinvention of the future, Silicon Valley still lacks a lot of diversity. And, and I think this is a place where Europe can actually make a difference because Europe is diverse by nature. It's, uh, it's grounded uh, on diversity. And, and so I, I agree, um, we should really stop about we, we should really stop obsessing about Silicon Valley in the U.S. And I think we should tap into this diversity to, to build our next, uh, our next generation of, of um, tech startups. Because the reality is that there is a large uh, untapped pool of talent yet uh, um, that we have at our disposal and that can make the difference uh, because at the end of the day the the, the tech war is a is a talent war and so those who will be able to tap uh, that pool will I think uh, will eventually win okay. thank you very much thank you Elena so
the, the, the speech marathon is done. So I think you, you need a break. And uh, so me too. And uh, so my proposal is, uh, is quarter to five. You guys have a break, enjoy the network. We will reconvene straight at 10 past five, meaning 10 past five, not 20 past five, 15 past five. I was looking for a coffee. No, 10 past five, because this is not, uh, this is not fun. We are working here. So 10 past five, we are meeting here. We will announce uh, what are the most four groups and the four main topics. We will build the four tables around. We have two, two moderators for each table, flip chart, and then you have 30 minutes straight to work on your proposal and present back to the plenary section. Is that a deal? Ten past five. Thank you.
Hello, hello, hello. Okay. I said actually 10 past 5. Sorry for being intrusive. Huh? So he, if you approach the, the... Close the doors. So now it's become the part when you can really contribute to, to the discussion. Mm -hmm. And uh, we identified four main uh, topics, areas of discussion. And so we are going to have uh, four tables, four working groups. And the goal for each table is to identify five to ten concrete action items to be submitted. So we want practical things. Okay? Something that could be actionable, not just uh, some uh, abstract talking and concepts. Okay? Action items, five to ten for each group. Four main areas of discussion. Table number one, the blue one, light blue, could be this one. So mean that you can also change, uh, change spots. Enabling ecosystem, meaning uh, what is required to move forward the startup European ecosystem. Could be startup definition, could be tax incentives, could be other incentives, could be anything that impacts regulation, tax, definition, anything, okay? So enabling ecosystem to create, to make Europe a better place to be a digital and not digital, innovative startups and innovative scale up. So not just to start, but also to be able to scale up. Table number one will be this one. You can change spots if it's not your main favorite topic. Table number two, the green one could be that one would be a relationship between startups and established existing companies. What we can do to foster this relationship in terms of procurement, investment, acquisition, anything. That table. Table number three, money, funding, access to capital, both at the seed, angel, and VC level. So early stage, later stage meaning also accelerators, anything that could be helpful to give, to inject fuel, meaning money, into these innovative companies. Table number four, so table number three will be that one. Table number four will be education-research. So we need to create a new generation of people that see startup as a desirable job. We need to put a stronger connection between the academics and the corporates and the startups between the universities and the people that are real doing things. So this kind of bridge between education, research, and startups, that's corporates, will be table number four that is the one that is closest to the door. Okay? So for each table you have a flip chart that is over there. We will bring it to you, so don't do... Table number one, the blue one, enabling ecosystem. Table number two, corporate startups, over there, the green one. Table number three, funding capital. And table number four, education research. Pick up the table that you like first. You have exactly 25 minutes to discuss. For each table, I will appoint a moderator. Jessica, Stacy, go to the table over there. Education research is your job, thank you. Uh, corporate startups, where I put uh, Salvo Mizzi, Eze Vidra, over there. Table number, enabling ecosystem, uh, I, will, I need a politician here, uh, which is Matteo Corbetta, Stefano Firpo, come over here. And uh, Isidro, perfect. And for Funding money, Candace Johnson, Praveen, Taro, stay there, is your field. So people with money here.
people with uh, jobs here, people that are doing nothing here, and the people that think over there, okay? Where is Massimiliano Magrini? Riusciamo a dargli un, un flip chart per ciascuno, riusciamo a spostarlo. Jose, perfect, this is your place. So you need to find uh, in uh, 25 minutes five to ten action items, write them down in your flip chart, and then we will discuss. Markers, ci abbiamo i markers, i pennarelli. Stand imagine what you are planning to write and we'll find the markers, okay? If not, use your nails.
Guys, sorry to be a pain in the ass again. <laughs> I just wanted to remind you that you have 15 minutes to, to go straight to the point, write down your conclusion, five to 10 action items, and then at six straight we'll report, you are supposed to report back two minutes each to the plenary session, okay?